<laughs> okay, so we're going to read the Word of God, and we are going to read from Matthew chapter twelve, and go down to verse fifteen, please. So, let us read from verse fifteen of the Word of God in Matthew chapter twelve. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. Many followed him, and he healed all their sick, warning them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant, whom I have chosen, the one I love, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out till he leads justice to victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. And then if you turn three chapters to chapter 15, and reading from verse 1 in chapter 15, We read, then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother. And anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say that if a man says to his father or mother, whatever help you might otherwise have received from me is a gift devoted to God, he's not to honour his father with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people... Honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand what goes into a, sorry, what goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth. Is what makes him unclean. Reads the word of God. The one question that I know many Christians have asked and do ask and struggle and wrestle with is am I, am I actually a saint? Am I truly a Christian? Am I truly born again? Because if I was, surely I would, and surely I wouldn't. Last week, you know, the preacher himself were, were talking about easy believism as being a, a mountain, as it were, that it's easy to be pushed off and uh, easy to fall into a pit where you're called a Christian when you're actually not just saying this prayer. Just say this prayer. Like in my experience, I wonder if I'm true saying because my experience was, you know, I came across Christian people and uh, I was told to say this prayer. I said a prayer and they said, oh, you're good to go now. Off you go to the waters of baptism. And now I'm asking, was it really? Was it really real? And the more I understand the truth of God's word, the less I measure up, Unless I measure it. You know, I used to think that it was our part to believe that God had provided salvation, but it was down to us to believe as it were. And easy believism said to me, only believe, only believe. Well, I did, but no, I, I'm not sure. Maybe you're here this morning and you've come down a, a pathway, not so much down a pathway, you've been climbing a pathway that I call that mountain of hard believism. Hard believism which is almost impossible to climb. And you're left looking longingly up. Can I ever be a Christian? 
Can I ever know if I'm saved? Maybe the worst of it and say, actually, I've fallen off that first mountain and I've been trying ever since to scale that second one. Do you believe in Christ the Lord? Oh, absolutely. There's the struggling saying, absolutely. I believe the gospel, but I'm just not sure it's happened to me. It is, is that you here this morning? To a measure. I would suggest most, if not all of us, true Christian, have struggled and maybe do still struggle with this whole question. Actually, you're on a dangerous precipice if you say, no, I've never had a doubt about it in my life. I would say that is something to be very concerned about. It's not that Christians should go moping to glory, Never sure, because there is an assurance we can have. It's not in there now, but it's the second part of that part that we saw there. That spoke about hypocrites, where we're looking today. But the second part says that there's an infallible assurance on the word of God. Number of occasions. Person may say, look. The object of my faith is an infallible God. I don't doubt that he's infallible. And all that he's done to make salvation. Oh, sir, no doubt whatsoever about that. But my doubts are about me. Has it happened to me? Has God actually saved me? You know, you talk of the subject assurance, and it's a lovely subject, and I, I like to look at it, but I, I can't come away from it but without still still feeling with me. It's presumption. Presumption. That God hasn't actually saved me, but I'm presuming that I have, that he has. If I had been saved, if he had saved me, wouldn't I be different? I don't love, I don't live as I should. Any change in me, any change that I see, is it not just learned behavior? You, know, you meet with Christians, you walk with Christians, you talk with Christians, you read the Bible. The Bible says, don't do this, don't do that. I try not to do those things, and I learn from other Christians. What not to do? Is it just not learned behavior? How can I know that I'm a Christian? Let me, these people honour me with their lips, we read, Matthew 15, 8. These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far, far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules of taught by men. They honour me with their lips. Their hearts are far from me. Oh, that's me. That's me. That's me. Who learn behaviour. Honour in the Lord of my lips, for my heart is far from him. What I want us to consider this morning, as I've said already, is the true saint discovered through the hypocrite. Let me read that again to you. It's not up there. I don't believe in putting screens and having other things while someone is preaching. It's the preacher, the Lord from the preacher you want to focus on. But let me read it again. Hypocrites and other unregenerate men may vainly deceive themselves with false hopes and carnal presumptions of being in the favour of God. The state of salvation, which hope of theirs, shall perish. First word, hypocrites. Oh, that's me. That's me. I'm a hypocrite. How would you define one? We had a young lady defining a hypocrite for us. Let's be even more succinct and, and suggest what the Bible says. Because if you actually look up on the Bible when it uses the word hypocrite, if you look at the Greek, the origin of those words, hypocrite, or that word hypocrite, it's an actor. It's a pretender. 
That's what you see. When you look at the word, you look at it in its original Greek, it's an actor. It's a pretender. Yeah, that's me. Full of pretense. Full of pretense. Well, I tell you, you may call yourself a hypocrite, but your thoughts are not the thoughts of life. They're not the thoughts of a hypocrite. A hypocrite says, I'm all right. I'm all right, yeah. No question. I'm going to heaven. If I die tonight, I will go to heaven. No question whatsoever. And the trouble with you lot is, you know, you, you, you need to not believing the word of God, to doubting, but doubting Thomas, not me. I'm all right, no question. No, you don't say that. And whatever you are, therefore, you're not a hypocrite. There's no one here who bounces along boasting that I'm all right no matter what, thank you very much. Like a hypocrite. Well then, re read it again, read it again. You said hypocrites and what was the other? Other unregenerate. That's me. I'm one of those other ones. Unregenerate, not born again. That's me. That's me. What does a hypocrite and an other unregenerate generate person do? What does a hypocrite and someone else who isn't born again but pretends that religion is it? Well, what do they do? It goes on to say they vainly deceive themselves. They deceive themselves. They tell themselves, I'm okay because of this or because of that. But you're saying the opposite. You're saying the opposite to them. You're not a hypocrite. The things they use, listen to this, things they use to say they're okay are the things you're using to say the opposite. Therefore, you're not one of them. You're not a hypocrite. It speaks about false hope in the Westminster Confession. And the hypocrite and others have a false hope. It speaks about false hope. And false hope says, I believe in Jesus. You're saying, I want to believe in Jesus, but I doubt that I do. I doubt that my belief is true and real. Because it comes from me. They say, I stop many sins. You say, I can see many sins in my life still conquering me. They say, I'm a better person now. You say, knowing the truth that I do now, I should be so much better. Now that's too descriptions, those two peoples there. Which one's the Pharisee coming into the temple? I thank you, Lord, I'm not like other men, etc., etc., and not like this tax collector. Which one's the Pharisee here? It's the hypocrite and other, isn't it? Which one are you? You're the tax collector. Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, a sinner. But the hypocrite, you see, never doubts himself. Never doubts himself. A sermon on salvation, that's for them, that's for others. Someone told me one time that I, I shouldn't be preaching the gospel when uh, there aren't any Christians, uh, non-Christians around, as it were, because you're, you're preaching to the, uh, the saved, as it were. You're preaching to the saints. They don't need to hear that. A dangerous thing to say, isn't it? Surely the gospel message itself should be the chief delight, uh, and obviously it depends on how it's preached for sure. But you, you know, it should be something we del we delight to hear and preach to right, and especially when the presence of the Holy Spirit is there. Every one of us should be coming under that and almost churning through it. It's like we hear the bad news and the 
judgment of God to come that, oh, you know, and we almost feel by the end that we've been saved all over again because we've, we've gone through reminding us of our sins. And some people might say that's not healthy, but it is because it keeps us humble and it keeps us depending on the Lord, which is what we should be. Just want to climb on it, don't you? The hypocrite and others. And I then. The things they use to say they're okay, you are using to say they're okay. Therefore, you're not one of them. The hypocrites and others hold to what the confession says a carnal presumption. That means to say, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. How many people, not just in Rain and Precinct, but when I was in Stoke and other places as well, how many people have said to me, when you ask them why, why, why they can be so hopeful that they're going to heaven when they die, how many people have said to me? And how many people have said to you, I'm a good person. Thank you very much. And when you try to press on that and show them actually that we're all sinners, well, no one's perfect. No one's perfect. I'm a good person. And then the usual one to hold up is someone like an adult kid. There, you see, that's a, that's a mark of evil. He didn't go to heaven. If he went to heaven, something's wrong with God for letting him go there. But as for me, I would not. Thank you. Carnal presumption. Because I've done this, because I've done that, because I haven't done the other. Huh, that man caught in that particular sin, or that woman caught in that, why have I done anything like that? Oh, presumption, isn't it? Looking and looking at others and setting your mark just a little bit above. You see things in them that put them down, but if anyone's a, a danger for the pit, as it were, it's them, but above that. That's the one. Oh, straight through. I haven't committed any major sins. Actually, I'm quite a religious person, etc., etc., etc. You can play that one out more. Often. But you see, you who struggle with this whole question of assurance, am I really his? You hold to none of that. You don't hold to any of that. Do you believe in the perfect life of the Lord Jesus Christ as the only righteousness for a sinner? That Christ lived the perfect life in order to Credit that to us, so that we who haven't lived the perfect life can go to him and say, you are the Lord, our righteousness, my righteousness. You believe in the perfect life of the Lord Jesus Christ? And do you believe in the atoning death of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross as the only means wherein your sins can be washed away? Your sins can be taken from you and transferred onto him. So that the Lord Jesus Christ, there he is, nailed to a cross, bearing even your sins. You believe that? You believe that is possible? You believe that is what the Lord Jesus Christ has done? Nay, not just possible and moving into the realms of, has it happened to me? But not just that it's possible, that it's certain that Jesus Christ saved, came into the world to save sinners. And to do that, he had to live a perfect life, fulfilling all righteousness. And to do that, he had to go to the cross and take all the sin of everyone who believed him on him, upon himself, and suffer and die there. So that the wrath of God that was aiming for us, coming from us, can be diverted onto him. So that when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, we can be saved. Do you believe all that? Do you believe all that? Say, yes, I do. Yes, I do. That only the perfect life and the atoning death of the Lord Jesus Christ will do. That's the only way to get to heaven. Do you believe that? Say, yes, I do. And do you know the path to salvation? Do you know the path to salvation? It's repentance and faith, isn't it? It's repentance to God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's coming to the Lord. It's that, again, we come back to that word repentance and those six things. What is it? It's the sight of sin. It's a sorrow for sin. It's a confession of sin. 
It's a shame for sin. And that hatred of sin. And a turning from sin. All those things are wrapped up in repentance. And I don't want to get uh, you into that now. I'm thinking, well, I don't know that I've felt enough shame. Or I've had enough sorrow or anything like that. That's just, that's repentance. You've seen your sin. You've found your sin. You've confessed your sin. You've said, oh, Lord, I'm a wretched sinner. Lord, I, I repent of these things. I'm sorry I've ever done these things. And I want to turn away from them. And I want to live a new life in you, Lord Jesus, because I believe in you. I believe you're the only means I can be forgiven, you believe. Of course you do. Of course you do. So that life, eternal life, begins when you fall before the cross. And you come as a sinner to Jesus. Yes, you say. Yes. Yes, I, I throw myself on him. I don't throw myself on my works. I throw out my works. I'm sorry, but if I'm looking at my works, I don't want to be sick. Throw them out. God, throw myself on him. But I just can't see you talk about the pathway, salvation's pathway. I just can't see myself on it. Don't you? Let me tell you, based on the gospel truth that you through me have just declared, and looking as we were at the hypocrites and others, though you can't see yourself on that path, I can. Okay. Can the word of God declares it? Turn with me to John chapter 8. Let's reinforce the points I'm making about the hypocrites and others. John 8. And we read there in verse 42. Uh, sorry. But we'll... The, the children of Abraham, it goes from verse 31, but I just want to come to the end it for time's sake, but Jesus is showing them that they're slaves to sin and so forth, and they say Abraham in verse 39 is our father, and then he says to them, if Abraham's your father, you would do the things Abraham did. And then we read in verse 40, as it is, you are determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the things your father does. We're not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. And then listen to this. Jesus says, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and now am here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. And we could go on, but leaving it there. If God were your father, you would love me. These are people, these are hypocrites. And others, and though they call themselves religious, and though they say to us today, oh, if we die tonight, we would go to heaven, they're not submitting to Christ. And he is the only way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him, but they're not submitting to him. But you do. You do. If I said to you now, you know, declare your love for the Lord Jesus Christ by getting on your knees and lying on your face, there's no one here who you might not like me for saying it because the floor's a bit dirty, but there's no one here who wouldn't do it. You would do that. But the hypocrite, the others, they don't. They don't submit to Christ. You see, you didn't see it there, don't you? In that passage. And you see it there in the Pharisees. The Pharisees, look at them. Outward show. They loved, didn't they? They loved to be seen. They loved the praise of men. Long prayers and places of honour and all these different things. And they've got all their religion, all the intricacies of it and so forth. But they were hypocrites. False. What's a hypocrite like? Think of the Pharisees. Read through the accounts of the Pharisees and what the Lord Jesus Christ says of them. How many times? Who does he declare the hypocrite most? It's the Pharisees, isn't it? And the teachers of the law and so forth. But just let me read you this. Let me just read you what a hypocrite is like. Because this 
kind of sums them up. This is from Proverbs 26, verse 24. I'm looking at it, time to find it. <laughs> a malicious man disguises himself with his lips. So what's the heart? It's malicious. Lips. He can say things that are opposite to what he really believes. In his heart, he harbors deceit. Though his speech is charming, do not believe him, for seven abominations fill his heart. His malice may be concealed by deception, but his wickedness, ah, oh, his wickedness will one day, it will be exposed in the assembly. You see that? It's a real malicious, it's a hate there. It's this hypocrite who's outwardly acting, playing, pretending what is in his heart, not anything like what you see or hear. Let me give you another one. Just one verse from Titus. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. Hypocrites and others claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. The hope, the hope of the hypocrite and others. What does it say in that uh, catechism in the Westminster Confession? It says their hope will perish will perish. Listen to what uh, Bildad says to Job. Bildad to Job in Job 8, he says this, and I almost want to read the whole of it, but it's it's probably too long, but he says this in verse 13, such is the destiny of all who forget God, so perishes the hope of the godless, the godless. What he trusts in is fragile. What he relies on is a spider's web. He leans on his web, but it gives way. He clings to it. But it does not hold. And if we read on, he goes to give other examples of the same thing. It's a vain hope. It's a presumption. It's a false hope. It's a hypocrite or one of the others who are unregenerate. And their hope will indeed perish. You can turn with me to Matthew 7 and see that. Let me give you Matthew 7 and well known uh, words uh, from the Sermon of the Mount, towards the end of the Sermon of the Mount. When Jesus says in verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? I would show. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from you, you evil deeds. I never knew you because I never knew your heart, because your heart was never truly given over to me. And so their hope, it will perish. Now, I don't believe there is anyone here who is playing the hypocrite or is resembling the other unregenerate person who has false hopes and so forth. But if, because I don't know the heart truly, if that is you, if you are playing the hypocrite, then all I can urge you to do is repent and repent quickly. Because God, though he's patient and long-suffering, God will not put up with a hypocrite. A hypocrite will be a race on the face of the earth. But ah, oh, how are you? You, you who pass the hypocrite's test. True saint, discovered through the hypocrite. You who pass that hypocrite's test, there are better things for you. Better things, you say? Better things? Why, why yes. Eternal things. Eternal riches in Christ Jesus. Uh, and though you tremble over this and fear about your standing before God, Listen to what the scripture. Listen to what the scripture says of Christ and his heart attitude towards you. We read it in our reading, verse eighteen, Matthew twelve. Here is my chosen servant, speaking of Christ. Who is my servant whom I've chosen? Getting it right. The one I love, in whom I delight. This is Christ. I will put my spirit on him, on Christ, and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out, 
No one will hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. And a smoldering wick he will not snuff out till he leads justice to victory in his name. The nations will put their hope. And I would love now to expound all those words, starting with verse 18. But time doesn't permit. But just to say in that verse 18 and verse 90, speaking of Christ, we can see in those verses the humility of Christ coming as a servant. The NIV doesn't even give him a capital S for servant. He is my servant, a chosen servant chosen by God and the one in whom I delight. Here is my chosen beloved servant. But he's not just a servant who's serving his father in some way to come and to bring the kingdoms of the world to justice and to come and, and exercise that justice and so forth. He's coming in humility to be a suffering servant. So that he can be a righteous redeemer, a savior, your savior, my savior. And he's doing that for those whom the father is going to give to him. Those who are wrecked through sin. Oh, there's not time to take up those words, 18 and 19, as I would like to. And as I started to when I was preparing at home, I had to put it to one side because of time's sake. But just consider that. Christ Jesus, the Lord of glory, is a suffering servant for you and for me, for us, for those who are wrecked from sin. Oh, we had it, didn't we, in the hymn? Let not conscience, no, that's, yeah, yeah. Let not conscience make you linger, nor fitness, fondly dream. All the fitness he requires is to feel your need of him. I think that was the one I wanted, actually. Where's the one? Yeah, but it's in the verse first. Come ye sinners, poor and wretched, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you. See, someone chose that hymn. How relevant that was to, to this morning's message. We come as wrecked people, individuals, collectively, wrecked through sin. Well, what's that you say? What's that? Well, we are, we are, in verse 20, we are the bruised reeds. We're the bruised reeds. We, we come to him as the one who is the lover of our souls. He will not cast out anyone who comes to him. All who come to him shall be saved. And when I talk about a pathway, a pathway of salvation, it's not a pathway, but there is a pathway that leads to salvation for sure. It's when you start to feel, you see your sin and, and you start to understand that you're undone and you, you can't put things, and you maybe go on a pathway of trying to sort things out. But when you really come to that point of repentance, then you're on that path of salvation. And it's not a path that you can be kicked off once you're born again. You're on it, you're in him, aren't you? So we can say, all who come to the Lord Jesus shall be saved, shall be saved. And so we're the bruised reeds who come to him, who is the lover of our souls. We come mangled, we come bruised. Our lives are miserable, in state of misery because of sin. That's every one of us. But you see, it says, a bruised reed, he will not break. There we are, we're bruised through troubles and sins and the misery and the folly and the things that we've done. But he's not going to break. He's not come to destroy us. He's come to restore us. He's come to mend us. He will not break us. Even though once we are on that path that means we're going to glory. Oh, stumble through sin. He's not going to break us. He's not going to say, well, I had you in mind to bring you to heaven, but now I'm not. Be off the path. Be gone. You could do that. But he's not going to do that. Because he can't do that. Because he's holy and just. And justice has been paid by Christ. And Christ's righteousness has been delivered up to your account. So you're declared righteous 
legally in God's sight, and your sins are gone because Christ has taken them. So it's not going to break you when you stumble, or when you have doubts. You walk along in a bit of unbelief about your standing before him. And what he's going to do, and what he's doing, what he's doing even now, and I pray he will do it even through this message, is what he's doing is he's lovingly restoring us. But more than that, he's making us better, better than we were. We are the Bruce Reeds. You and I, we're doubters, aren't we? So many of us, a true saint, has doubts. Has doubts? Is he really saved me? Particularly when we fall into sin. Ah, and the devil sometimes loves to come and put those thoughts. You call yourself a Christian? You can't really be a Christian. If he'd really saved you, you'd be better than you are. Look at oh, look how good he's going along. Now that's a true saint, but not you. Not you. A true saint gets those doubts. I have concern if you've never had those doubts. I really do. But if you've had them, and, and they troubles you, then I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged that you're troubled by them. If you're not troubled by them, then I'm, I'm discouraged and I'm concerned for you. That you're troubled by them. And you don't want to know that they would go away. That's encouraging. That's encouraging. You and I are doubters. We say, you really say me. But if I ask you, you'd say, you know, I so want to be his. I, I hope I am. I think I am. And so forth. And yes, I, there was a time when I really believed the Lord gave me repentance and I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of us can say it was a dramatic time. Others well, wasn't so and what have you. But but yeah, that was in the past. And now I, I wonder, I have this question, but I, I so want to be his. And I so want to be established, rooted and grounded in him and have a certainty that I'm his. Do you know, if you said to me, to make your repentance sure and the repentance that God accepts, you've got to travel now on foot to John O'Groats. Um, on the way, on the way, if you want to be righteous and have your righteousness accepted by God, no, not your righteousness, let me put that again. On your way, if you want to know that your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is genuine and real, then you've got to hop up Mount uh, Ben Nevis on the way. You do, you do. Let me say, I'm not trying to promote here works. What I'm saying is, if somehow the Word of God revealed that to have true repentance and to be gifted with Christ's righteousness and to have your sins taken away and your faith to be genuine in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's on foot up to Ben Nevis, climb that, and then to John O'Groats. You do it. You do it. We'd all do it. And what do you say to that? Oh, you of little faith. Each and every one of us. Oh, we of little faith. Can you not see, when you agree with me with that mountain trip there that's unnecessary, can you not see that by the attitude, by the response from your heart, as I've been preaching, they're there already. Faith and repentance. It's there already. It's not somewhere remote for you to chase. It's in your heart. It's in your cry. It's in the cry of your heart that's there now that says, Lord, I so want to belong to you. I so want to be rid of all these doubts and uncertainties. That's the cry, not of a hypocrite or other. That's the cry of your heart, which is the cry of the same. God has been at work. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Give thanks for that. If at the moment you can see nothing else, if at the moment you can go no further than that, then get on your knees when you're on your own and give thanks for that, that from your heart you can say, Lord, I so want to be yours and so want to be yours without any doubt. And I would throw off anything, Lord, that you showed me that was wrong in my life so that I could know for a certainty that I'm yours and I belong to you. Then praise the Lord if that's your heart attitude. I tell you, can't you do it? That, that's, that's a heart of faith. That's one who loves the Lord. That's one who's been born again. So even if you can't go any further than that at this point, praise the Lord for that. Thank him for that. And by faith, take hold of that and say, Lord, I'm going to take that little bit that I've been given this morning and I'm going to say, that makes me a saint. And I'm not going to listen to the voice that said, that presumption. Your presumption was, look, you, you swore earlier or something like that. Don't listen to that. I'm not going to listen to that. 
I'm just going to thank you, Lord, that you put that into my heart. And then in accordance with what was being preached this morning, and in accordance with your word, that's me a I praise you for your work in my life. In your heart, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You've come to weary and heavy laden, and rest is there. Rest is there. It's yours. It's yours. You are, and I am. We are but smoldering wicks. Look, it's there in verse 20. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. We are smoldering wicks. But you are smoldering. So a smoldering wick, well, there's not much going on there, really, is it? Just a bit of smoke. Smoking flax, I think the King James gives us. Smoking flax, you can see there's smoke coming from it. Not a lot, but there's sun smoke. Well, you are a smoldering wick, but you are smoldering. And that's the point. If you are smoldering, you're smoldering because fire is there. Life has come. Light is in you. The spark of life is in even you. Even though you're only a smoldering wick, the spark of life is in you. What does it say? He will not snuff that out. He will not snuff that out. Someone goes camping and uh, they get a smoldering wick, a little bit of smoke. What are they going to do? They need some heat. They need the fire. They're going to do all they can to fan it into flame. They need it. But you've come to Christ, the omnipotent one, the all-powerful one. And he will not snuff you out, not because he needs you, but because he loves you. He loves you. Is Jesus the lover of your soul? And it says that till he leads justice to victory. He's paid justice. He's paid the holiness and the justice of God. He's paid on the cross. He's paid for you. And so his fan is now on you, as it were. He will fan you on to victory, to cause that smoldering to break out into a bit of fire. Wow, look at that fire. And maybe to fan it even to more flame. He's not going to let you go. The Westminster Confession of Faith, in this chapter on assurance, goes on to speak about this infallible assurance. And to speak, yes, here about the hypocrites and others, that's not you. That's not us. We may be weak in faith. You may be weak in faith here this morning. But it is faith. Weak faith is true faith. And therefore, to finish with these words, as someone wrote once on an email to me that really took me back, a big blessing, you know, uh, good luck, kind regards is a common one, isn't it? This person wrote, in his grip. See, in his grip. If it's down to your grip, forget it. Rip up everything we've said and ignore it and be troubled and worried. But it's not. You're in his grip. And he will never leave you, forsake you, and he will never let you go. So go home and praise the Lord with rejoice because you're not a hypocrite or one of those other unregenerate people. You're someone who loves the Lord Jesus Christ, even if your love for him is cluttered with all the litters and troubles of this. You're in his grip. Amen.